Okay. Thank you everyone so, so much for your patience. Technology is a fickle mistress, especially in times like these. Um, so today we're doing the first of our new series, Be Well Read, with um, Deb Gerard. And as a little bit of background about our dear, dear friend Deb, um, she is the founder of Be Well, Serve Well, which is a wellness initiative where she has dedicated herself to helping people heal. She has a background in theological studies and is trained in holistic approaches, including mind, body, spirit, nutrition, whole food, plant-based nutrition through Cornell and that through Cornell University Center for Nutrition Studies. For Deb, it's not about right food or a right body. It's about real lives, yours and mine, learning to live through everyday challenges, living lives of health, joy, and generosity. And I can tell you that Deb is extremely generous. So without further ado, Deb, you can take it away and lead us on this flagship episode of our new series, Be Well Read. Awesome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Connor, for the kind introduction. And thanks again to everyone for your patience uh, as we've gotten these little uh, bumps in the road today um, ironed out. Uh, I am glad and grateful to be uh, back with the Story and Song community and to welcome some friends from the Be Well, Serve Well community as well and to introduce this new series, Be Well Read. Now, like you, I love books. Uh, books have shaped my life uh, since I was a little child and my mom and dad were reading to me. Then in elementary school and high school when I found a love of reading for myself and that has continued throughout my life and it shaped my faith, my family, my perspective on all things. And um, I've been thinking about this concept be well read for quite a while. So I'm, I'm glad that Mark and Donna were willing to partner with me and to offer you this series. Uh, we'll be coming to you every couple of weeks in this way uh, to share some books from the bookshelves of Story and Song Bookstore Bistro in Fernandina Beach. Um, now just a little bit of trivia as we get started. If you noticed in the, um, in the logo, uh, Be Well Read, and then in the logo of Be Well, Serve Well, there's this little parenthetical E. You might be wondering, huh, what's that about? Is she selling honey? Well, no. The name Deborah in Hebrew means worker bee. And so I have a little bit of a connection with bees, and I thought that that would be a fun way um, and a distinct way uh, to name this wellness initiative where I believe uh, we have to first be well in order to serve well, and each of us is called to serve. Now, back in July, if you joined us, I shared my perspective on this season of uncertainty that we've been experiencing through the pandemic. And I offered some practical steps, maybe some of you have been following those, steps I believe will boost our immunity and strengthen our health against the coronavirus. I suggested things like be honest about your health, be willing, be informed, be curious. Be present, be real, be intentional, be grateful. But it turns out that I left one out. Be well read. Now Mark and Donna put it this way. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Read deeply. Read deeply. I love that. In this series, I'm going to introduce you to some books that are on the wellness and wholeness shelves at Fernandina, at the Story and Song in Fernandina Beach and also on their website. And they're books that have had an impact not only on my life, but on the lives of clients and people who've come my way in workshops and, um, and food for thought talks that I've offered. Information that's had an impact on my own health and the health of others. And I'm only gonna share just enough to whet your appetite so that hopefully you'll decide that you too wanna have these books on your shelves. So let's get started. Let's be well read. Today I've chosen a really small book, but a meaningful book. I think it's packed with great information. Food Rules by Michael Pollan. Now, Michael Pollan is a New York Times best-selling author, not only of this book, but of Omnivore's Dilemma, of In Defense of Food, and a new book he's written called How to Change Your Mind. 
And he writes from the place where nature and culture intersect. And he says that's on our plates, it's in our farms and gardens, and in what he can, calls our built environment, which is our culture, our society. Now, right off the bat, you might be saying, food rules, who wants a bunch of rules we have to follow? That sounds kind of restrictive, right? <laughs> well, let's look at it again. Rules is one of those words in the English language that you can look at a couple of different ways. And that's how I choose to see this. Food rules. Food has power over our health. And in a country where 63% of deaths every, every year in America are from diet-related causes, it's pretty clear that food has power, food rules over our health in some meaningful and measurable ways. Now, life's gotten pretty complicated, and our food culture is no exception. And what Pollen is doing is truly offering us an eater's manual, as the byline says. And he offers us answers to three questions. Here they are. What should I eat? What kind of food should I eat? How should I eat? When people come to me for guidance related to their health, not always, but often related to eating lifestyle, one of the very first questions that almost every person asks is, Deborah, what should I eat? What should I eat? So Pollen is giving us an answer to that. This question and the popularity of this little book, Food Rules, um, is a reflection to me of the struggle that we all face in relationship to food and body. And while I help people navigate both the foods we eat and the life experiences that eat at us, I truly believe food matters and that food matters are complicated. The food industry doesn't do us any favors. It's distorted and hijacked food. And no longer do we even really know what real food is. Um, we're constantly bombarded, as Pollen says, by edible food-like substances created in labs by scientists. It's not real food, and it's sold for profit with little thought of the health of the consumer. And in turn, the consumers are confused, you and I. But food rules is an attempt to cut through that chatter with seven simple words. Here they are. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Seven simple words. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Now, early in the introduction, Pollen offers us a couple of facts. Uh, and the first one, I'm going to read some of this to you. The first one is basically, it ain't working. No, he uses a little bit better grammar than that. But you may have heard the standard American diet, SAD, really truly is sad, as I mentioned earlier. 63% of deaths in America every year are from diet-related causes. I think we can do better than that. Pollen offers this fact first. I'm just going to read for a minute. Populations that eat a so-called Western diet, a diet generally defined as consisting of lots of processed food and meat, lots of fat and sugar, lots of refined grains, lots of everything but fruits and vegetables and whole grains, invariably suffer from high rates of the so-called Western diseases. He goes on to say, listen up, virtually all of the obesity and type 2 diabetes, 80% of cardiovascular disease, and more than a third of cancers can be linked to this diet, the Western diet. Boy, that's a whole lot of sadness, way too much sadness for me to, sw to swallow. But then he follows it up pretty quickly with some good news and some hope. Let me continue reading. People who get off the Western diet see dramatic improvements in their health. We have good research to suggest that the effects of the Western diet can be rolled back and relatively quickly. In one analysis, a typical American population that departed even modestly from the Western diet and lifestyle could reduce its chances of getting coronary disease by 80%, type 2 diabetes by 90%, and its chances of colon cancer could be reduced 
by 70%. That's a better way. That's some good news. And so food rules begins. What should I eat? Tip number one, eat food. Eat food. Well, that might seem obvious. Deborah, what else would we eat? But as Pollen points out, with more than 17,000 new products making their way to the grocery shelves of our country every year and vying for our food dollars, exactly how to eat food isn't very obvious. According to Pollen, our choice is between real food and industrial novelties. Again, those edible food-like substances created in labs by scientists, they aren't food. Though millions of dollars are spent convincing us and making us believe that we're eating real food. We're not. We're not. Eat food. Real food. Another tip. Avoid foods that have sugar in the first three ingredients. Now, most of us only turn a product over to check the calorie count. We might check the grams of sodium or fat, right? Maybe sugar maybe protein. We need to move our eyes down a little bit further to the ingredient list. This is one of the tips that I also share with my clients often. Let's look at the numbers that count. Because those other numbers, the grams of sodium, grams of fat, those are the result of something called reductionism in science. And it's not as complicated as it sounds. Here's what reductionism is. Reductionism says that if you and I eat the exact same amount of a product that you and I will each ingest X amount of, say, sodium. It's not true. Your body is different than mine. My body is different than yours. And we have different needs. We're deliciously diverse, as I like to say. So let's move down, as Pollen suggests. Let's look at the ingredients. Let's count what counts. And if sugar is one of the first three, let's put that product back on the shelf. Now I want to give you an example, Cheerios, with apologies to mothers and fathers and parents, grandparents, everywhere, though it's really General Mills who should be apologizing to the parents and grandparents. As Pollen teaches us, labels list ingredients uh, in the order of weight that they, that product in, in, uh, includes. So the first ingredient has the most, the second ingredient's a little bit less and on down the list. Cheerios with cornstarch as number two, which turns to sugar in our bodies, and sugar as number three, needs to go back on the shelf. Not our, own, not our pantry shelf, the grocery store shelf. Let's count what counts. Let's count what counts. Now, does anybody remember the movie Silence of the Lambs? Jodie Foster, Jack Nicholson. Um, one of these tips that Michael Pollan offers is a little riff on that. It's called the silence of the yams. Stick with me. Avoid products that make a health claim. Now, first of all, if it makes a health claim, it has a label, so we're already sliding down that slippery slope, right? Secondly, though, it's the big food manufacturers that have the money to fund the studies to support their health claims so that they can get approval from the FDA for those health claims, all in an effort to sell us what? edible food-like substances created in labs by scientists. Um, to quote Michael Pollan, don't take the silence of the yams as a sign that they have nothing of value to say about your health. Eat food, real food. Now, another couple of tips that are back to back that I especially like, um, especially for our Fernandina friends, um, tip number 15 says get out of the supermarket more often, and here's how. Tip number 16, buy your snacks where? At the farmer's market. Fernandina has a great farmer's market. We're all happy about that. There's no high fructose corn syrup at the farmer's market. There's no fancy labels, no long list of ingredients. It's just fresh, real, whole food picked at the peak of flavor. Now, Pollen goes on. His, his book has, I think, somewhat over 60 tips. I'm not going to share them all with you. As I said, I want you to be curious. I want you to um, want the book on your shelves. But that first question, what should I eat? We've asked and answered that one with a few examples. 
The second question is what kind of food should I eat? Tip number 22, eat mostly plants, especially leaves. Here's the evidence to back that one up. In countries where people eat a pound or more of vegetables and fruits a day, the rates of cancer are half what they are in America. Boy, I'm sold, are you? Eat plants, especially leaves. Now this is fun, see if you can follow this. Tip number 24, eating what stands on one leg mushrooms and plant foods is better than eating what stands on two legs. Think fowl, which is better than eating what stands on four legs, cows, pigs, and other mammals. It's kind of a fun, easy to remember tip, right? I've got another one that I want to share with you and I'm going to read this one because I think it's that important. You'll see why. Eat sweet foods as they're found in nature. In nature, sugar almost always comes packed with fiber, which allows for absorption before you're so full. You don't eat too much because you feel full sooner. That's why you're always better off eating the fruit than drinking its juice. In general, calories taken in liquid form are more fattening, more fattening because they don't make us feel full. And humans are one of the very few mammals who obtain calories through liquids after weaning. Think about that. So don't drink your sweets. And remember, there's no such thing as a healthy soda, right? All right, this is kind of fun, especially again if you have children or grandchildren. Don't eat breakfast cereals that change the color of the milk, right? Well, it seems obvious, but we've all been there. We've all been there. And of course, these are the cereals stocked on the shelves right at eye level, right at eye level for our kids, right? Those little people who are trusting us to feed them well. These are the favorite convenience foods for a lot of parents, a lot of families, but they're highly processed and they're loaded with chemical additives, loaded with dyes, refined carbs. It turns out Lucky Charms aren't so lucky after all. So step away from the cereal aisle uh, and maybe toss out a few that might be on your pantry shelves. Now again, here's a tip that I share with my clients. Uh, it involves a couple of questions. And the tip is this, eat when you're hungry, not when you're bored. So often when I'm working with someone who comes to me with unwanted weight or maybe binge eating or overeating, some really significant challenges that a lot of people face, um, I offer two questions, and I say to them, I say to you, when, when you're thinking you're hungry, ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I hungry, or am I just bored? Am I bored? Now, I have an uncle who, if you ask him, are you hungry, he'll say, what time is it? As if the clock could tell him if he's hungry. Being bored shouldn't either. Ask yourself, when that voice comes in your head and says, I think I want to eat, or your child's head, are you hungry or are you bored? And if you're bored, find something fun and fulfilling to do. Maybe read a book, right? And then eat later, like maybe when you're hungry. Another tip, a couple more here before we go. Spend as much time enjoying the meal as it took to prepare the meal. Wow, what if we did that? To me, this is a great way to honor the chef, the cook, whether it's yourself or someone else. And from my training too, I can tell you that when we slow down to enjoy a meal, we invite health to the table. We truly do. And we find ourselves present to the moment, eating when we eat. Let's not miss the moment. A favorite phrase of mine is simply, come to the table, come to the table. There's evidence that meals around the table are fast becoming a thing of the past. That's sad to me. Still, there's also plenty of evidence that those meals around the table, especially family meals, have a significant difference to make in our lives and in our health, for our children, our grandchildren, for us. According to the British Columbia Medical Association, children who eat at least one meal every day around the table with the family 
develop more nutritious eating habits, they have better grades, better vocabulary, and better, better communication skills. And my hunch is we adults would too, especially engaging with the younger generation, right? They have something to offer us. Come to the table. It's true that every moment is an opportunity for ceremony and for deeper connection. Spend as much time enjoying a meal as you do preparing it. Okay, one more tip, one of my favorites before we sign off. Treat treats as treats. You can see why it's one of my favorites. It's pretty memorable, it's catchy, it's easy to remember, but to me, I like it because it keeps everything in perspective. We all love treats, but we live in a world and in a culture where we have treats every day and we've lost all perspective. So when we feed our children, and let's face it ourselves too, dessert for breakfast every day, think those sugary cereals, bagels, pastries, donuts, right? Right? We've lost all perspective when that becomes breakfast. And here's another point, in, uh, a case in point, where outsourcing our food has gotten us into trouble. If we had to make those things, if we had to make the pastries, if we had to make the donuts every day, we'd eat less. We'd absolutely eat less. And to me, along the way, we've lost sight of what I call the occasion. And I'm reminded of my own family. Um, every couple of months, we would go to my grandmother's for a Sunday lunch or a weekend meal. And uh, it was a treat. It was a treat. She would load up the bowls with cream corn and biscuits and gravy and fried chicken. And I'm making your mouth water. <laughs> it was a treat. It was a treat. And it took her time. It cost her dear, dearly, too. Now as an adult, I realize that even more so. It was an occasion. We loved it. And we loved her a lot. Treat treats as treats. And I invite you to the treat of this book being on your shelves as a resource. It's simple. I encourage you to just pick it up, order it online if you want to, um, go into the store, they're open. Put this on your bookshelves, pull it out, read a couple of tips, put it back, think about them, in ingrain them in your life and invite them to your table. You see, food indeed rules over our health in ways we might not have thought about before. This is an interesting read, it's inspiring, and it's informative. And even my brother, whose favorite place to eat in Atlanta is this greasy old drive-in, one of the oldest, I think, in America, called The Varsity. I gave him this book once, and he came back to me and said, you know what, it was approachable, it's reasonable. So to me, there's no reason not to have it on your shelves, my friends, and I hope I've whetted your appetite to check it out, check it out. I also hope that you will um, like and follow not only Story and Song Bookstore Bistro, but also Be Well, Serve Well. Remember, there's two E's, and now you know why. We'll cross-pollinate a little bit, and every couple of weeks, I'll come back to you and share another book that's had an impact on my life a book that I hope will have an impact on your life so that you too might be well and serve well and be well read. I'll see you in September. Thanks so much for tuning in. Well, thanks so much for that, Deb. Um, I, I definitely know that I'm gonna be uh, reassessing some of my um, healthy eating habits or at least trying to employ some uh, awesome. healthy eating habits. Awesome. And, um, and I just, I'm so glad that we get to have this uh, resource to us. And I'm so glad that uh, Deb, for everyone watching, is going to be joining the, the likes of uh, Deersha and Ron Kurtz, mm -hmm. two of our other favorite uh, video content. And as, Deb, and as Deb said, we're going to be back here in, um, in two weeks in September to yep. talk more um, about uh, being well read. And thanks everyone for joining us. And remember that if you miss any of our Facebook lives, everything is up on our YouTube channel. You just have to look up Story and Song Bookstore and Bistro. Got to get the whole thing because there's lots of stories and lots of songs on YouTube. <laughs> and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, and everybody. Like I said, um, we'll see you back here in two weeks for more conversations with Deb. Um, thanks so much.